Welcome to another video for biology. Uh, in this video in biology, I'm going to be highlighting DNA. Uh, more specifically, the story of DNA. How is it that we've come up, we came about the modern conception of DNA? What it looks like, where it came from, the things that it's made out of. To start this story, we need to go back to 1860, or the 1860s, uh, to a humble monk named Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel had a passion for studying peas. Okay? So he was a scientist who lived in a, a monastery. He studied peas. He grew peas. And uh, he found something pretty interesting when he grew peas. Uh, for example, when he mixed, when he pollinated a, uh, a green pea with a yellow pea, he noticed that in the next generation that the yellow pea was gone. And he wondered what in the world happened to it. So as he continued to grow these peas, he realized that in the next generation, that yellow characteristic would come back. So a big question that he, that he asked was where and how was this hereditary uh, memory or signal being stored? How was it that the characteristic, the yellow characteristic in the P was disappearing and then reappearing uh, in uh, later generations? So that was a big question that got this whole, this whole thing started uh, in DNA. So that got, the, uh, that got the attention of Thomas Hunt in 1909 at Columbia University. Thomas Hunt noticed something very interesting uh, when he studied the cell. So as Thomas Hunt was looking inside of a cell, he noticed some very definitive features in the nucleus of the cell. He noticed that as the cell was dividing, okay, he noticed that these X-shaped features that he would later call chromosomes because when he gave them a color dye, they came out very bright, they were very chromatic. So these chromosomes, again, these X-shaped features, um, as they would divide, they actually broke up into, into the exact equal numbers on each cell. So the original cell would have, tw uh, let's say, 23 chromosomes, and the brand new cell would have the exact same amount of chromosomes. So here's where Thomas Morgan looked at, and he said, hmm, this, quite, this might be uh, the feature that I've been looking for as far as looking for that signal that helps to determine the different features of organisms and the pea plants that Gregory Mendel was looking at. So his study continued uh, and he expanded to uh, growing to growing um, fruit flies. Some of the things that he studied in fruit flies was the eye color. He was very curious as to how and where the uh, the gene or this characteristic of eye color in the fruit flies was passed on. Now the reason why he grew fruit flies was because he was able to grow them because it had a very fast reproduction rate and he was able to grow many of them and produce many experiments uh, in a short amount of time. Another characteristic that he paid attention to was the wings of the flies, how they had different wings. So when he was mutating these genes, when he was mutating, when he was able to isolate and identify where these genes are located, he noticed that, that whenever he would mutate a specific area, that the same, the same group of characteristics were uh, being manipulated. And he concluded that the genetics or the genes for these particular characteristics had a linear arrangement. In other words, there, he could identify the exact location uh, for each specific characteristic, and they tended to be grouped together in the chromosome. So for example, if we take a look at this chromosome, theoretically, if he, if he identified this section of the chromosome as the eye color, he could look at a subsequent um, chromosome from another fruit fly and that same location had the same gene. Likewise for, let's say, the vestigial wing of the fruit fly, if he wanted to manipulate that particular uh, gene, he could find that in the same location um, and another chromosome. And usually, again, like we mentioned before, if, he, if, if, it affected one, if it affected one gene, it would typically would affect another gene, um, and it would be in the same location in another chromosome. So they were grouped together. They were linearly, they were linearly placed uh, along the chromosome. Okay? And as we mentioned before, he also noticed that uh, the chromosomes from one, gene, from one cell to another were usually identical. Okay, so with this in with this in mind, um, Thomas Morgan wanted to take a closer look at these chromosomes and see what was in them, and he made a pretty interesting discovery. 
he took a look inside of these and he realized he identified the six components that uh, the chromosome was made out of uh, for the most part, or the DNA anyways. Um, he identified the phosphate, thymine, cytosine, deoxyribose, adenine, and guanine as, a com as the main components for DNA. So as great as this um, innovation was, he still didn't know what this DNA molecule looked like. So he had the pieces of the puzzle, but he didn't know how the pieces came together. Along came, and then along came a scientist, P.A. Levine. When he looked at the research that Thomas Morgan made, he made an interesting um, he made an interesting assessment and conclusion of this. And he thought to himself, uh, or he hypothesized that the DNA molecule was making these um, was using these particular components, but they were being organized in a in a repetitive in a repetitive manner. So Pierre Levine looked at this information, and he said to himself, you know, he likened it to having a, um, a six-letter alphabet. You know, with only having six letters, you're limited to the, the variety of words that you can make, and, and hence the variety of sentences and paragraphs and the amount of information that you can convey in just six letters. And on top of that, he also said that, well, these not, not, only, they're, not only are there only six, but they keep, they only repeat, they, they exist in a repeating pattern. So if you have a six letter alphabet and it only stays in that particular order and it just repeats itself, then it limits even more the amount of information that these six letters could convey. So thanks to P.A. Levine, the study, the study of uh, DNA as the information carrying molecule um, for the various characteristics that we see in nature was pretty much put to a halt and the attention was diverted to proteins. Scientists were now looking at proteins uh, as the main information carrying molecules. And this carried on until the 1940s. When you have a scientist named Frederick Griffin, he came up, he devised an interesting um, an experiment to try to identify what in fact was the information carrying molecule. So what he did is that he made a batch of lethal bacteria and that bacteria he injected into a mouse and as you can guess that lethal bacteria killed the mouse. Okay, So then he made a, a batch of non-lethal bacteria and did the same thing and the mouse lived. And all of this, all of this makes sense. But this is where things got a little bit interesting, is where he had a lethal batch. He heated that lethal batch until the bacteria died. Okay? So the bacteria died. Then he then injected this bacteria into the mouse, and it, he, the mouse remained alive. So even though the uh, bacteria was lethal at one point, once heated and killed, it didn't kill the mouse. So again, this all makes you know, good intuitive sense. So he repeated this process by heating up lethal bacteria and he did something different this time. This time he mixed the dead bacteria into a non-lethal live bacteria batch. Okay, And then he injected this same solution into the mouse and it killed the mouse. Now this question baffled Frederick Griffith. Uh, what was it that killed the mouse? Because the bacteria that was supposedly lethal was dead. So how could it how could it come back and kill the mouse? Okay. So as you as you review or you conclude this uh, experiment, he went back to the mice to the mouse the mice and he extracted the bacteria, and in the lethal bacteria he was able to get of course lethal bacteria, and then the non-lethal there was no lethal, and no lethal bacteria also with the uh, lethal heated. But with the lethal heated bacteria mixed with the non-lethal living bacteria, he was able to extract bacteria that was lethal. Okay, so something was going on here. Something was happening where the non-lethal bacteria was being transformed into lethal bacteria. And he, he surmised that it was the DNA in the bacteria that was being shared or being absorbed by non-lethal bacteria 
that caused the death of the mouse. So along comes another scientist called Oswald Avery. He took the experiments from Griffith and he, like Griffith, was also baffled as to why was this mouse dying? What was causing the death of the mouse if the lethal bacteria was supposedly heated and killed? So what he did is he did the same experiment except he took the mice out of the equation and he just mixed the bacteria. Okay, And he concluded, he was able to definitively conclude in 1944, he, wrote a, he published a paper with some of his scientist um, partners and he concluded that it was DNA that was causing the transformation. So in conclusion again, the non-lethal bacteria that was living was able to absorb the DNA of the dead lethal bacteria, thus transforming it into a lethal bacteria, and then it killed the mouse. He hypothesized that the non-lethal bacteria absorbed the DNA of the lethal bacteria, even though it was dead, he abs it absorbed the DNA and it transformed it into a lethal batch of bacteria, thus killing um, the mouse. So Avery's work actually helped to understand and helped to pinpoint more specifically that, hey, it's actually DNA that's passing along uh, this genetic information. And some scientists agreed with him and some didn't. One that did was Erwin Shagraff. Shagraff looked at, his, at the experiments of Thomas Avery, I'm sorry, I keep saying Thomas Avery, of Avery Oswald, okay, Oswald Avery. Avery was on to something, he said. DNA might be the new language of biology, he said. So he looked, he took a closer look at the DNA molecule, okay? So he looked, take a closer look at the DNA molecule and he counted, carefully counted the molecule and he counted every time each base came, came up. And he found something interesting. So as he was looking at thymine, for example, and he counted out the thymine, he realized that it was always equal to the amount of adenine he would find in the molecule. So then he looked at the other base. He looked at cytosine. He said, hmm, okay, so he counted the cytosine, and lo and behold, it equals out in ratio to guanine. So the thymine and adenine always equaled out in ratio, as did the cytosine and guanine. So when he would compare the number of cytosine he would find in DNA to the number of adenine, they never balanced out. But it always did balance out with guanine. Okay? And he was looking at this at other molecules or at other species. For example, Streptococcus, which is a type of bacteria, he noticed that the ratio of adenine and thymine were almost exact. And the ratios for th uh, guanine and cytosine were also almost exact. And then he looked at E. coli, same thing. The human being, same thing. So he basically came to the idea that, ah, they always come in the same ratio. They must mix together somehow. But he wasn't quite sure how. And all of these science experiments from Oswald Avery to uh, Thomas Morgan, Gregory Mendel, and Shagraff, Erwin Shagraff, all of this set the stage for basically the final um, the final experiments that helped to identify what what was the genetic information, where was the genetic information located, and how was it shaped. And then here comes in two of our last characters, James Watson and Francis Crick. James Watson and Francis Crick didn't have a very comprehensive background uh, in physics or um, or in DNA, uh, they had other backgrounds, but they this question of DNA really really um, really caught their attention, and they actually did some pretty decent work, and they presented a model with with what they thought would be the uh, what the DNA molecule looked like, so they presented a DNA molecule that was a triple helix, and on the inside was alternating phosphate and sugar molecules and they were all back to back and then on the outside there was the nucleic bases see they figured out that well hey look DNA has to copy itself so that must mean that these bases must be on the outside to make copying much easier 
Well, you have an expert in crystallography who um, knew what the, what the DNA molecule sort of might have looked like. Um, and based off of the research that she did, she she looked at their model and she says, ah, this is wrong. Okay, Watson and Creek were very embarrassed. The scientific community said, hey, you guys don't even have a background in this stuff. You guys need to butt out and get out. And they were basically embarrassed and they were kind of sent off and told to leave and leave the question alone. Well, a couple years passed, 1953. Watson and Crick come back. They want to take a look at this DNA, see how far they've come along. They look at the leading scientist of DNA, and lo and behold, this guy presents a similar molecule, a similar shape to what they had presented a couple years ago. So they thought to themselves, wait a second, they haven't figured this out yet. How could that be? Well, they jumped right back into the race, and there are three pieces of information that they used to help identify the shape of the DNA molecule. And this was based off of the research, for the most part, of Rosalind Franklin, the same woman who kicked them out the first time and said, hey, you guys are wrong. Well, they said, okay, fine. And they ended up using her research. Two out of the three main things that they used to, discover, to figure out DNA was thanks to Rosalind Franklin. The first one was that she, she helped to determine that DNA had a very specific width. Okay? She had a very specific width, and it couldn't be any longer wider than what she had determined based off of the images that she had taken with an x-ray machine. She was an expert with the x-ray machine, and um, she also helped to determine that the backbone, the phosphate and sugar molecules, were actually on the outside, not the inside. Okay? So those were two main things that Watson and Crick used. Okay? Now... With the models that most scientists were presenting, with uh, the backbone on the inside and then the phosphate and the uh, the nucleic bases on the outside, Rosalind Franklin looked at those um, at those uh, molecules and she determined this can't be because when you put the bases on the outside, okay, you come up with uneven widths, okay, and she already knew that the width of a molecule of the DNA molecule had a very specific width, so this will not work. Okay, and here's an image of the uh, image. Here's an image of the X-ray image that she took of DNA. Okay, and based off of this this image, she was able to uh, summarize or conclude that DNA had a double helix and it had a very specific width of 20 angstroms. So the designs that the other scientists were coming up with did not fit because the width was specifically 20 angstroms all the way across, and with these you came up with different widths, so it couldn't be. Okay, and then of course your graph. He did not respect Watson and Crick. In fact, when Watson and Crick came to him and asked asked him for, hey, well, what do you have so far? What do you think about all this? He did not respect them so much so that he's like, well, here, here's my research. Go ahead and take it. See what you can find. He did not realize or he did not think that they would actually get anywhere with this. And uh, so Watson and Crick have these two these two scientists to thank for uh, their discoveries. So once they have that research, they, boom, they booked it and they went off on their own to see if they could figure out what this DNA molecule was uh, shaped like. Okay. A couple of things real quick before we get into uh, what actually DNA looks like. Um, so uh, Crick was able to determine that, again, because the bases, the alternating bases, phosphate and uh, sugar molecule were on the outside, he still noticed that the shapes or the, the molecule that they would come up with was very unbalanced. Okay? It was unstable. So he had a stroke of genius. He realized, well, all those sugar molecules, which are in green, okay, you see how the um, each sugar molecule is pointing up? Okay? So they're parallel to each other. He had a, kind of, he had a stroke of genius and he flipped them. And as it turns out, flipping them helped to stabilize the molecule. So they're anti-parallel, okay? Meaning the sugar molecules are parallel to each other, but they're pointing in opposite directions. And we'll, we'll talk about that in another video later. And then Watson came along. Watson came along and figured out that the bases, thymine and adenine, which again, thanks to Shergaff, 
he realized that these two are most likely combined together. He realized that when you put that when you combine these two with a double double hydrogen bond, and you combine cytosine and guanine with a triple hydrogen bond, they actually form the same length. And that was the last piece they needed to determine how DNA actually looked like. Pretty interesting. So with this information, they were actually able to win. <clears throat> In 1962, they won the Nobel Prize. Okay, They won the Nobel Prize along with one of Rosalind Franklin's research friends. Okay, Now, Watson and Crick were able to get a lot of the information that they used uh, from Rosalind Franklin, not from her directly, because they actually didn't have her permission to use her research. Her, her research was handed over to them and allowed, and they were allowed to see her research without her permission. Okay, So in 1962, they won the Nobel Prize, and unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin died in uh, 1958 from ovarian cancer. Um, they attribute her cancer to most likely uh, the overexposure to x-rays because, again, her research, her field, her expertise, she was an expert with x-ray crystallography. Uh, taking images of tiny, tiny little molecules like DNA with x-rays. And they feel like because she didn't take precautions in protecting herself, that she ended up getting ovarian cancer and she died. And many believe that if she were alive at that point, she would have been given the Nobel Prize along with those guys. Uh, many believe that uh, there was a lot of sexism that was going on with uh, Watson and Crick. And that's why Rosalind Franklin was kind of left out of the picture. Um, but either way, uh, we want to give her her just due uh, in this in this video because she was a major, major contributor to uh, finding out what DNA looked like, which is the double helix that we're all used to. That does it for this video for DNA. Uh, good luck in your studying.